Good afternoon. Before we get started, if there is anyone that needs interpreting services, if you could please go ahead and type that into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, we want to be certain that our fantastic interpreters are available to you. Okay, well, I will get us started. My name is Dr. Heather McCarty, and I am a professor of history and gender studies here at Ohlone College, and I am one of the co-directors of the Lytton Center for History and the Public Good. Along with my fellow co-directors, Dr. Catherine Michael, who is a professor of history, and Dr. Kyle Libby, who is a professor of history, we would like to welcome you to today's talk entitled Gun Violence in America, How We Got Here and How We Solve This Problem. But before I hand things off to my co-director to properly introduce our speaker today, I want to share the Lytton Center's mission statement. The Lytton Center considers ways that the study of the past can help shape the present and the future. Our mission is to inspire the Ohlone community to work for the public good through programming focused on access, equity, inclusion, justice, and service. The Lytton Center explores challenges facing our community and the world, past, present, and future, and fosters big ideas that will inspire and transform Ohlone and the larger community for the better. Through training, programming, and capacity building, the Lytton Center empowers students to advocate for a just and equitable world. Today, during the talk, we're really excited to hear your thoughts and your questions. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen as the talk is progressing to ask your questions or to make your comments. And we will have plenty of time at the end of today's talk for question and answer. And now I will hand things off to Dr. Catherine Michael to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Robin Thomas. Robin Thomas joined Gifford's Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence as, as Executive Director in 2006, serving until 2022. Robin supervised the organization's work drafting and defending safer gun laws, as well as educating legislators about evidence-based gun policy. Robin has testified in Congress and before state and local lawmakers as an expert witness on gun laws and the American gun violence epidemic. Robin has written about gun violence prevention for newspapers, including the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. She has been interviewed on television programs such as 60 Minutes and PBS NewsHour. And she has offered her expertise to publications like the Washington Post, The Guardian, and NPR, among many others. So thank you so much for joining us today, Robin, and we're all really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, my name is Robin Thomas, and for the last 16 years, I have been the executive director of the Giffords Law Center. Um, in 20, late June 2022, I transitioned to the role of senior legal advisor to the Law Center. Many of you probably know Giffords because of the experience of our namesake, US Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who was shot in the head um, at a Congress on Your Corner event in early 2011. Um, Gabby has made tremendous strides towards her recovery. She now um, is able to travel and speak about this issue and continues to work hard um, to represent the issue in venues across the world, um, notwithstanding the fact that she has pretty severe aphasia and it requires a tremendous amount of work for her to speak publicly as well as um, she's paralyzed in part of her body. So even getting around is challenging, but she's incredibly inspiring, courageous leader and someone I had absolute pleasure and pride in working with for the last 10 years. So just a quick little bit about my background. Um, I am an attorney by training and was a plaintiff's class action lawyer and a public defender and worked at another nonprofit before joining Giffords 16 years ago. It wasn't called Giffords um, back then, it was called the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, but we merged with Gabby's organization about seven years ago and rebranded as Giffords. 
Um, my background as a litigator and trial lawyer, um, I think is a really important piece of the perspective that I bring to the issue of gun violence and the solutions. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you a bit about today, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share a screen in a minute and talk about first, kind of where we are and how we got here. So what is the nature of gun violence in America? And a little bit about the background and politics as to why we are in the position we're in where this is has felt like a really intractable problem for a long time. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna talk a bit about the types of solutions that we could implement that could make a tremendous impact in reducing gun violence in America. One of the things I always talk about when I give presentations about this issue is that people are often hopeless when it comes to gun violence. We are at a 40 year high right now um, with almost 40,000 Americans a year dying from gun violence. It can feel very hopeless. Um, and I am always very keen to send the message that this is a problem that has solutions. We know what those solutions are. We are making incremental steps towards putting them in place, but we have a long way to go. But that doesn't mean it's a problem we can't solve. So I hope by the end of this talk, you will have a sense of what those solutions are and the direction we're heading in. Um, I am going to try to share a screen now. Let's see. I think this should work. Let me, okay. So this is trying to move my, um, ah, there we go. This is a, how did we get here? All right. So, Oh, my computer is being jumpy. There we go. Okay, so this is the picture that I wanted to start with. Um, this diagram gives you a sense of what gun violence is in America. And essentially with that approximately 40,000 deaths a year, the number of people who are actually shot every year is about triple or even quadruple that. So it's about 130 or 140,000 Americans who are shot every year. And so this number represents the people who actually die from gun violence. And I sometimes think it's not the best way to talk about this issue because so many people who are shot and survived suffer a lifetime of. Um, medical and emotional and spiritual issues connected to that trauma that isn't represented by a lot of what we're going to talk about today. But I do want to name it because I think, you know, when you think about people who are touched by gun violence, a lot of times the focus is on people who have lost someone to gun violence, but the ripple effect of the number of people shot every year in America is truly astounding. If you look at that 140,000 people, um, you know, the number of the ripple effect of people touched is millions and millions of people. Um, if you don't know someone who's been impacted by it yet, chances are at some point in your life, you will just by virtue of the numbers. So with that in mind, here's our breakdown. We have suicides. Suicides make up about two thirds of all gun death. Um, I'm gonna give you a few statistics on suicide, but ultimately I do wanna say that um, it's, a, it's the most, I believe, overlooked aspect of gun violence. You know, we, it's not what makes it onto the news. It's not the issue that is talked about, you know, as much, um, but it's an incredibly important part of the problem because it does impact so many people. Um, guns are used in only 5% of suicide attempts, but comprise more than 50% of suicide deaths. So one of the things that we talk about in suicide is, is that it's a lethal means problem. So we often refer to the lethality of means because 
when you have access to lethal means, there is a much, much higher likelihood of completion of the act of suicide. Other countries have similar suicide attempt rates as we do in the United States, but no other country has the level of suicide deaths as we do in America because of access to firearms. Um, you hear a lot of talk about violent video games or mental health crises, um, any variety of excuses for why we have the rates of gun violence and gun death we do. Um, but really ultimately when you look at statistically other countries, it's very clear that the only real difference we have in the US is access to guns. Um, suicide is an incredibly impulsive act. Research shows that most people who attempt suicide attempt it within one hour of ideation. So if there's a loaded weapon accessible, the likelihood of that person dying is much, much higher than if it wasn't accessible. Um, and most firearm, most suicide attempts are actually um, that are attempted with a firearm. It's a gun not owned by the person. So we'll talk a little bit in a little while about the policy solutions to some of these issues, but simply locking up guns, safe storage laws um, would have a huge impact on suicide rates in the US. So that's suicides. Um, you know, as you can see from this diagram, we also have unintentional shootings, a much smaller number, but still with the numbers on the table, significant police shootings. And um, I actually am going to, in a little while, talk about urban gun violence, which you'll see in the circle within homicides and police shootings together a little bit, because really the solutions to both problems have a ton of overlap. Um, intimate partner homicides or domestic violence related homicides are a huge part of it and mass shootings, which many of you know about because that tends to be the type of gun violence that receives the most press coverage, the most attention. Um, it's not the highest numbers, but it's the parts of gun violence that I think are the most shocking tend to take place um, in locations that people can relate to. So, you know, a lot of times suicides are very personal as with domestic violence and, um, you know, something like urban gun violence is happening a lot in communities of color or impacted communities. I'm not sure, is my screen sharing still on? I lost my screen, give me one second. Okay, let me see if I can pull that back up. Sorry, just trying to, it, it went away. I'm sorry for this delay. I'm not sure why my screen share, but if anybody, any one of the um, administrators who are watching can help with this, I'm not sure why it lost my screen share. Here, we'll try this. I'll try this again. Robin, we do, we see it now again. Okay, let me see if this works. All right, so let's try this. It's a different um, screen, but we'll we'll just roll with it. Um, so we talked a little bit about gun suicide and the fact that um, you know while guns are used in only five percent of suicide attempts, they are responsible for a huge number of suicide deaths. Um, urban gun violence, which we were just talking about a little bit. Um, is an important part of the conversation because um, it, it really does impact a very small portion of the population so disproportionately. And I think especially in this moment in time where this country is doing at least a slightly better job of understanding the impacts of white supremacy and systemic racism. Um, one of the many ways that that has exhibited itself in our country is through some of the impacts in um, those communities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the solutions to urban gun violence, which I'll just preview for you by saying it is one of the most inspiring parts of all the work I do. So the approaches to reducing gun violence in communities of color um, that affect this very small 
population are actually some of the most effective and exciting steps forward. Um, intimate partner homicide, domestic violence we talked about. Um, you know, one of the upsetting but interesting things about domestic violence is that um, not only are women in America five times more likely to die when there's a gun in an intimate partner situation, um, and firearms are used in more than half of the intimate partner homicides in the US, um, it's an issue that also can be addressed pretty directly through policy. Um, we already have some steps in the right direction. We do limit under federal law the access that domestic violence abusers have to guns, but there's a whole lot of loopholes in that law, some of which were recently filled by the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act signed this June, but some of which are still outstanding. Um, and we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Mass shootings. So mass shootings are a relatively small proportion of gun violence, um, but amazingly, and probably not surprisingly to many of you, 31% of the world's mass shooters are in the US, even though we have a very small portion of the world's population. And as we'll talk about in a little while, um, you know, access to assault weapons, large capacity ammunition magazines, um, and lack of mental health services are some of the reasons why we see that to be the case. Um, police shootings, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of overlap between police shootings and urban gun violence. They stem from a lot of the same um, root causes and have a lot of the same solutions. So, you know, I believe the last statistic I read was that 800 um, African-American men have been um, killed already this year by law enforcement. and I don't know, I haven't seen very many of those in the news. So a lot of people think this is a problem that's get, gotten better or is getting better. It's especially after you know what happened with George Floyd and some of the other high profile police shootings, but actually it is not getting better. And some of the back and forth that's happening politically around you know sort of law and order and crime is undermining um, progress on this, on this part of gun violence. Um, unintentional shootings, really often relate to minors. Um, it's often, you know, children even under the age of 10. Um, and as this little statistic indicates, more than 4 million children live in homes with loaded unlocked guns. That to me is an astounding situation when you have so much gun violence that um, parents who have young children don't appreciate the risk created by having loaded unlock guns in the home. Um, and that's actually, as I mentioned earlier, one of the areas of this problem that we can most easily solve that just simply locking up guns and storing them separately from ammunition um, would have a huge impact on this problem. Okay, so now I'm going to take you off screen share. Okay, here I am. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these issues and the types of policies that are effective at solving these problems. Um, the other two things that I do wanna talk about a bit today, which are not strictly policy, are litigation. And I'll start with the little brief synopsis of where we are with the Second Amendment. I think it's a really important part of this conversation and some of the other litigation related issues that are happening around guns. Um, and then I just wanna talk a little bit about the politics and I'm gonna actually give you a really quick two minute backstory on how we got here. Essentially, the NRA was an organization created after um, the Civil War and part of it was the intention to help to train citizens to be better sharpshooters, better able to be drafted and part of um, future military. Part of what came out of the Civil War was the complete unreadiness of the civilian population um, to be able to participate in that war. And so the NRA was government sponsored and it was intended to be um, a way to train the American population to better be able to handle and shoot firearms. And really the focus of the NRA was on that, was on you know, clinics and trainings and helping. It was, they ran a ton of sport shooting um, competitions, things of that nature. And it was an organization that actually 
positively supported gun regulation. They were behind all of the initial gun regulations, um, which banned machine guns during that time where we had um, kind of the machine gun Kelly, um, the, the Al Capone days where there was a lot of machine guns on the streets being used. Um, they were behind the 1968 Gun Control Act, which implemented a very limited background check law, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit with regard to current state of the law. And then they were actually supportive of additional legislation right up until the 70s. Um, so the NRA were, you know, if not the ones leading the charge, certainly not um, fighting against gun regulation. Well, the, the NRA in the late 70s had a massive, they call it the revolution. There was a group within the NRA that basically went into their national annual event and got the, the leadership voted out and themselves voted in. And this group of individuals led by Wayne LaPierre, who is the current head of the NRA still 40 years later, um, had a very different agenda. And that agenda was a very hard line anti-regulation approach, what we call in lawyering the slippery slope. So the idea that we couldn't have any regulation because that would lead to confiscation of firearms like what happened in Nazi Germany. And, and really, I will just sort of end that piece of who the opposition is by saying two things. One is that, um, most Americans don't realize that. Many of us do who pay attention, but most Americans when they're polled don't realize how hard line the NRA is. The NRA really represents the gun industry at this point. If you look at their board of directors, it's almost all um, people high up in ownership of gun manufacturers. So their policy positions, which fight against regulation are intended to sell more guns to more people, make more money for the industry. It's a lot of fear mongering. It's a lot of um, politicization of a base that is single issue by, um, if you read NRA publications, very aggressive, negative fear mongering and a lot of marketing for the industry of more and more lethal weapons. So the NRA rep really represents the industry but claims to represent gun owners and it's created a lot of dissonance. Um, the other interesting piece of that is that most Americans don't realize how weak our gun laws are in America when they're polled. Um, the average American doesn't know that we don't have universal background checks that anyone you know, in most states can buy things like assault weapons, large capacity ammunition magazines with no background check, with no training. And in many states now can carry them loaded on the street with no license. So the reality of how weak our gun laws are isn't something that's well known by the American population. It's why when people are polled, do you support stronger gun laws? They say no. When, we, when they're asked, the same person is asked, do you support background checks? training, any other things like that, that we don't have in place, they say, yes, of course. So that dissonance between their understanding of what we have um, and what we don't have. So that's a little bit, you know, this single issue, aggressive, very well-financed lobby that represents an industry. You see parallels in the oil and gas industry or the car industry, or, you know, the big far farming, pharma, all the things that we know in lobbying affect policy in America. Guns is a big one of those. Um, and it's also a culture war issue. So alongside things like um, gay rights and um, life and choice and abortion rights, um, you know, it's another one of the culture war issues that's often leveraged by politicians, even when their constituents the majority of their constituents support gun regulation, they're trying to mobilize a smaller portion of their base. So they're willing to abrogate what their majority of their constituents wants. 92% of Americans support universal background checks, and yet we can't get that through the Senate, which tells you something about who they actually represent. And it's not 92% of Americans. So that's a little of the background. Now the policy, and I'm not going to go through this too fast, but I am not going to go too deep because um, there's a lot of policies. And if you go to the Giffords website, the Giffords Law Center website, which uh, my team and I built about five or six years ago, you can look at each separate area of law and there's an explanation, or sorry, each separate area of gun violence. And you can see in great detail, the policies that address it. So I'm going to briefly go through the ones I spoke about earlier. So suicide. The most direct way to deal with suicide would be to do things like have safe storage laws, 
child access prevention laws, um, you know, having waiting periods is a tremendously impactful way to reduce suicide. As I said, suicide is a very impulsive act. States that have waiting periods like California, which has a 10 day waiting period, um, sees dramatic um, significant, statistically significant reductions in suicide. So there's all of these methods we can use to reduce suicide. And it also includes things like educating parents, educating the medical community. There's a lot of contact that individuals who are um, suicidal have with the mental health or just physical health system. Um, so educating the entire medical community has been shown to have a tremendous impact on reducing suicide. So there's all of these policies that we can use. The other thing that I've noticed in the past few years is a movement towards allowing people to access firearms who present a risk. So for example, veterans who have um, certain mental health disqualifiers used to not be able to buy guns because of the risk of suicide. And that's one of the things that was undone during the Trump administration. So allowing people who present a risk to themselves um, to have stronger systems in place to prevent them easy access to firearms. Um, interestingly, there's a new law that started, it, it was put in place actually after the shooting at UC Santa Barbara at Isla Vista in 2016 here in California. It's, in California, we call it a gun violence restraining order, but in other states, it's called an ERPO, extreme risk protective order, but the short hand is often called red flag laws. And basically the way those work is that if you are someone who presents an imminent threat risk to yourself or to others, you can go to court. Usually it's just the family or law enforcement that can go to court, but some states allow a broader range of people to go to court. Um, you can seek to have a temporary restraining order on someone's guns. So here in California, that would include removing guns from somebody because we actually know when people have guns here, we have some records of that or, and or preventing them from buying guns. Now that initial protective order is only in place for 21 days and then you get to have a full hearing. So if you're someone who's in a temporary crisis and you want your guns back after 21 days and you can prove that the time of crisis has passed, you can get your guns back. If you are still in a time of crisis and law enforcement or family members believe that you should continue to have your guns restricted, the court with a full fair hearing is able to look at that. And when you look at some of the instances, particularly of very notorious mass shootings, like Isla Vista, where the young man had posted videos threatening um, to hurt all these women and his parents knew he had guns and called law enforcement. Law enforcement had no tool with which to remove those guns. The same thing in Parkland, the young man in Parkland who had those guns had many complaints to law enforcement and the FBI. It was known that he had guns, it was known he presented a threat, but there was no mechanism to remove those guns. So these laws are really effective at helping prevent suicide as well as mass shootings. So a lot of times in both of those instances, we do have indicators that someone is at risk. And there was just recently in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, an allocation of $250 million in funding to help states implement these types of laws and systems. So it is a really great step forward to have this type of mechanism in place. Um, so that's a little bit about suicide. Um, I've said a bit about unintentional shootings or what sometimes is called you know, accidents, although we believe accident is a bit of a misnomer because there are ways to prevent them. And so, you know, safe storage of guns, locking them up, educating parents, you know, a lot of pediatricians in many states speak to parents who have children about having a gun in the home. A lot of these steps have a lot of positive impact. Um, I'm gonna hold off for a second on both police shootings and urban gun violence and talk about those together. So I'll talk a bit about domestic violence. Um, there's a number of ways to reduce domestic violence shootings. One of the, so currently under federal law, if you buy a gun from a federally licensed firearms dealer, you have to get a background check. That doesn't apply to private sales. So states have had to step up to fill that loophole for private sales. So in California, whether you buy a gun from a federally licensed firearms dealer or from a private individual, you have to get a background check. Not the case in 28 other states, 29 other states. 
So some states have closed that loophole. Now, when you get that background check, there's three categories of people prohibited from buying firearms. There's people who've been convicted of a felony. There are individuals who have um, who rise to a certain level of mental health prohibition, which are very actually restrictive. It's only people who've been involuntarily committed or who ha have a court adjudication of mental incompetence. So those are the only two classes of individuals under mental health prohibitions prohibited by federal law. And then the third category is domestic violence misdemeanor convictions. It's the only non-felony conviction that is a prohibiting qualifier, disqualifier, However, that misdemeanor conviction only applies under federal law in very limited circumstances to people who are married or have children together. Um, and that's basically it. Now, we consider the two biggest loopholes in that federal law to be dating partners, which makes up about 50% of all homicide attempts and domestic violence and what we call the stalker loophole. Um, it doesn't prohibit people who, who are convicted of stalking misdemeanors to be prohibited from buying firearms. And we know that in almost 80% of homicides with a gun and domestic violence situations, there's a previous complaint of stalking. So these are two loopholes that could be um, filled in to help address the problem of domestic violence and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act closed the boyfriend loophole. So we did just see some action to, to make that better. Um, obviously when it comes to something like domestic violence, there's a lot of non-gun related steps that can be taken, which I won't get into, except to say that um, this is an area where Unfortunately, you have to consider it more expansively than just domestic violence deaths. We know that there are millions and millions of women living in domestic violence situations with a gun where it's not about whether they're shot or even killed. A lot of times guns in those situations are used to terrorize and control women. And I say women, I know it's occasionally men, but the vast majority of these cases are women. So that's an area where I think we have a lot more we can do outside of the gun space. Okay, mass shootings. Um, there's a couple of interesting points to make about policy around mass shootings. As I mentioned earlier, um, assault style weapons, large capacity ammunition magazines are very, very common, if not universal when it comes to mass shootings. Those are almost always, if you talk to military folks, Battlefield guns, guns designed to kill the maximum number of people in the shortest amount of time, especially when you couple those weapons. AR-15 is one of the best known with large capacity ammunition magazines. A huge amount of damage can be done in a very short amount of time. Um, one of the examples we use with large capacity ammunition magazines is that the shooter, when Gabby Giffords was shot, had an assault weapon with two large capacity magazines, each holding 33 rounds. He got off all the 33 rounds in his first magazine. Every single one of those bullets hit a human target. And when he paused to reload the second magazine, it was duct taped to the back of the first one. And when he took it out to put the new magazine in, he fumbled and was tackled by bystanders and stopped. So had he only had a 10 round magazine, which is not considered a large capacity magazine, there would have been a lot of lives saved that day. The shooter in Aurora had a hundred round drum. Thankfully it jammed and he wasn't able to get off all hundred bullets, but it just tells you something about the choice of weaponry in a lot of these mass shooting situations. The other thing that I think is a really interesting development, there's a book by my friend Mark Fullman called Trigger Points that just came out this year, which is a really interesting analysis of how to identify potential mass shooters and how to prevent mass shootings uh, with a more sort of scientific and evidence-based approach to understanding how we can know um, when those kinds of shootings are more likely to happen. And we do know a lot more now than we used to. So that's mass shootings. Now, 
that's some of the types of gun violence we're dealing with and some of the types of policies that can be used to reduce and address them. And there's some great books which detail all of the evidence. So the government, um, NIH and CDC paused all funding on research into gun violence and solutions to gun violence in 1996 as the result of something called the Dickey Amendment, which was um, an amendment passed in order to um, cool or chill or reduce government funding for gun violence. And I won't get into too much detail about it. Under Obama, there was actually a reigniting of some research into gun violence. $50 million was allocated to um, CDC, but it will take some years before those results are known. In the interim, a lot of private individuals have um, not private individuals, sorry, private institutions have been funding research into gun violence and solutions to gun violence. Notably, um, Johns Hopkins has a tremendous program. Harvard has an injury research center. Stanford does a lot of work on this, University of Chicago. So there are some, you know, um, UC Irvine has a great program and actually the state of California just funded gun violence research at the state level through a program at UC Irvine. Same thing in New York state. So we do have some research happening now, a fair amount, but for many years, we haven't had much. But the research we do have has been really well compiled in some books, um, mostly done by Daniel Webster and Jan Bernick at Johns Hopkins, which show the evidence-based approaches and the results of these policies. So they'll look at states where these policies are in place and try and get an understanding of whether we have evidence that these policies work. I will say generally that states with stronger gun laws have lower rates of gun violence and gun death. California, which has one of the biggest populations, one of the biggest, most complex issues of gun violence, has the strongest laws and one of the lowest rates of gun violence in the country. Not that any gun violence isn't too much, but there are incredibly powerful correlations between the strength of gun laws and rates of gun violence. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about police shootings and urban gun violence. So this is an area that actually isn't as much about the guns. Now, it is not to say that we don't need to be taking policy steps in order to reduce the flow of illegal weapons into com impacted communities. Um, reducing trafficking, we haven't talked about trafficking because it doesn't relate perfectly to like the problem of gun violence, but you know, reducing trafficking also has a set of policies associated with it. Things like one gun a month laws. So in California, you can only buy one gun per person per month. If you want to build a collection of guns, you can only buy them one at a time. It doesn't really inhibit your ability to build a collection over time. But what it does inhibit is your ability to go out and buy 100 guns, drive across to, I don't know, the streets of Oakland or San Francisco or Los Angeles and sell them illegally. So one gun a month laws, um, you know, all kinds of regulation of um, like not, we don't have registration in this country, but we can have sales records. We can have reporting requirements if people buy more than a certain number of guns. We can even have a better job by BATFE of tracking gun sales and the movement of illegal guns so we can understand where the source of illegal guns are. Places like New York City, um, which has very strong gun laws or Chicago, the guns are all being trafficked in, in the case of New York City from the Southern states, they call it the Iron Pipeline up 95. Um, in the case of Chicago, mostly coming in from Indiana. So, um, you know, trafficking is a piece of the problem. And when it comes to urban gun violence, certainly dealing with trafficking is important. We call that the supply side of the problem. But what's been really interesting in the last 10 years has been seeing the impact and effect of intervention strategies. So once upon a time, the first really well-known successful one was in Boston called the ceasefire program. There's a few different models of gun violence intervention strategies. There's the cure violence model and the group violence intervention. There's hospital-based intervention programs, but they're all premised on the same theory which is that a lot of individuals, so you look at a city like Oakland, it was shown for a long time, people thought Oakland's a violent city and the problem is with not enough education or access to healthy food or um, jobs. And so it's just the violence is begotten by poverty and lack of opportunity. And when they dug really deep into the nature of the gun violence problem in Oakland, what they found was that actually the violence in Oakland 
was being driven by a very, very tiny portion of people. So 0.5% of the population was driving a huge majority of the gun violence. And so the decision was made to launch what took years to get off the ground, but, but was incredibly successful called the Ceasefire Project in Oakland. And that program was intended to identify the individuals most at risk of shooting or being shot and to basically intervene, to call them in. They meet with law enforcement, community leaders, family members, church leaders, city officials, and they basically offer the person a choice. Either change direction and we will help you, we'll offer you job training, addiction treatment, anger management, whatever that person needs in order to choose a different path. And we will help support you in leading a safe and productive life or continue to terrorize the community and we're gonna remove you from it. Um, we're gonna either put you in jail or you know, do whatever it is that we need to do to take you out of the community that you're causing so much damage in. And in the case of Oakland, the program sort of took this form um, around 2012 or so, and between 2012 and 2020, gun violence in Oakland reduced by almost 50%. So tremendous success without necessarily passing new laws, without, you know, going out and, you know, arresting and putting everyone in jail, which doesn't actually serve the same purpose, um, but rather offering individuals most at risk the opportunity to become productive members of the community. And with that, I think there's an important comment about where we invest in these issues. You know, the fact that the city of Oakland invested, you know, $10 million in this program says a lot about the priorities of the community, says a lot about the willingness to right some of the wrongs that have put us in this situation in the first place. I'll never forget sitting at the table with some of the community leaders there and saying, out loud, you know, I just, it's so powerful to see people being given a second chance um, at a, at a healthy, happy life. And one of the community workers saying, you know, listen, with all due respect, this isn't a second chance. This is a first chance. A lot of these individuals have never actually had an opportunity like this to be supported, to get job training, to get housing, whatever it is that they need in order to make, make different choices. So these are really incredible programs in, on so many levels. And in some cities, as the violence has been reduced in these communities, of Camden, for example, New Jersey, things change within those communities. Little League rates, the sign up for Little League went up by like 400% in Camden as violence reduced in the community through this intervention strategy. So it really does change the face of these communities. Um, and the relationship to police shootings is this, you know, a piece of what drives community violence, and this can get into a very separate deep conversation, which we won't have time for today, but essentially when police use repressive tactics, when they are being abusive, when there's racist um, policies and behaviors by law enforcement, that has a tremendous impact on gun violence rates. It increases gun violence rates dramatically within the community against law enforcement and by law enforcement. So the behaviors and training and ethos of law enforcement in these communities is really important. You know, when there's violence in a community and the people in that community trust law enforcement, they'll go to law enforcement trusting that they're going to address the crime. When there's no trust in law enforcement, you end up with a lot of vigilante justice and internal dissent. So there's, there's a nullification, there's no respect for those external systems. And really reformation of law enforcement is a crucial piece of these programs in Oakland. They couldn't have done what they did without the involvement of the police force, of the police chief, buy-in from the law enforcement community to do de-escalation training, to do all kinds of work, to build trust back with the community. And Giffords wrote a wonderful report, Giffords Law Center, about building police community trust and the tremendous positive impact that comes from that. And I think it's a really important point because there is a lot of controversial debate right now about what is the best way for law enforcement to be behaving, to be funded. How do we deal with crime? And I think there, there's a big piece of the puzzle missing if we don't talk about how much better things get for law enforcement and the communities that law enforcement serves when we focus on building trust in all the ways that are now being shown to work. 
So that's a lot of policy stuff. I know that's a ton of information. I hope that by making the point that different policies really need to be considered when you're thinking about different kinds of gun violence. I think of gun violence as a big onion and each layer is a different type of gun violence that has different solutions that go along with it. And some of these solutions overlap. So things like risk protective orders, address both mass shootings and suicide really, really well. Things like safe storage laws deal with accidents and suicides really well. So some of these um, policy solutions are more geared towards a certain type of gun violence and others really um, have a more overarching impact. But really, if we as a country are going to dramatically reduce gun violence in America, we need a comprehensive approach. So we would need to actually have all of these measures in place across the country in order to see the kinds of dramatic reductions that we see in so many other countries. Australia and Canada and other places where they have a lot of gun ownership, but they don't have the level of gun violence that we do because they have much stronger regulation than we do. Switzerland, Israel, there's a lot of countries that actually have high levels of private gun ownership. Um, lastly, before I finish, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions, um, I want to talk a little bit about litigation because I think you can't talk about gun violence and gun policy without some understanding of the Second Amendment. Now, the Second Amendment, if for those of you who don't know it by heart, um, says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, for 200 years, more than 200 years, that was read to me and by the Supreme Court and many others um, that this Second Amendment right related to, was related to a militia right. So it was necessary in order to have citizen militias. At the founding, we didn't have a standing national army, so state militias were very important, and they were made up of private citizens. So the need to have arms in order to ensure that we had um, armies was sort of considered, and, and there's Supreme Court decisions which interpret it that way. Well, after a concerted effort for many decades by the right, by the NRA, by actually a li big, strong libertarian movement on this issue um, and academics associated with them, the Supreme Court in 2008 decided a case called Heller, H-E-L-L-E-R. And the Heller decision said, actually, no, basically overruled 200 years of precedent without kind of admitting they were overruling precedent and said, you have an individual right under the Second Amendment to own a gun for self-defense in your home. So a very, very narrow decision striking down Washington, D.C.'s ban on private gun ownership. And it was devastating for those of us in the movement, not because the decision itself had broad scope, but because what it did was it led to an avalanche of cases challenging all kinds of other gun regulations across the country to try and expand that right. So as soon as an individual right was named by the court, then the NRA and their allies went and challenged everything to see if they could poke some holes in this sort of policy space. So after Heller in 2008, they're really, the court did not take up cases. They rejected cert, certiorari in over a hundred cases, basically saying, no, for now, Heller's all you get. This is the right. You can't prohibit gun ownership, but we're not saying anything about your rights outside the home. We're not saying anything about um, the second amendment protecting the types of guns you can own or where you can carry them or anything. So that sat there for a while and we defended and worked on amicus briefs and worked with jurisdictions across the country defending both at the city and state level gun regulations. Um, unfortunately, as many of you who follow the court will know, um, we now have a 6-3 split on the Supreme Court, even with a 5-4 split, I think, this would not have been the case, but unfortunately with the 6-3 split, um, it was inevitable that a new gun case was gonna be taken up and we were not feeling optimistic of the outcome. Um, the Bruin case was recently decided, which challenged New York City's law, which was highly restrictive of who can carry loaded concealed weapons on the street. Um, I would say kind of as a side note, it makes sense to me that a city like New York should have the right to decide the criteria for who gets to carry loaded concealed weapons on city streets, both to protect their citizens, to protect law enforcement, um, for all the reasons that those of you who've spent time in New York City will probably understand that it would just, just simply astounding to imagine people in 
on those streets and the subways and the theaters, wherever it is with loaded weapons. Um, unfortunately, the court struck down New York City's very restrictive concealed carry permitting system. We don't know yet exactly how it's gonna turn out because now um, it also meant that California, Hawaii, New York, uh, Massachusetts, Maryland, a number of other states with similar laws to New York's have to rewrite their laws. Uh, I'm sure the attempt will be to make the law, the new law as restrictive as possible without running afoul of the Supreme Court's decision. But ultimately it's going to mean that states and cities can't restrict that tightly who has loaded concealed weapons. Uh, I can talk more about it if there's questions, but we have what we, what we refer to as um, may issue permitting systems, which have a lot of discretion built into them like New York's shall issue systems, which means that as long as you pass a set of criteria, they that law enforcement has to issue you a permit where I think we're headed more towards that after this Bruin decision or no permit systems, which is now in place, unfortunately, in quite a few states. I think we're up to almost 20 states that you can carry a loaded concealed weapon on the streets with no permit at all. Um, so you're not even in the system. And many of those are also states that don't require background checks. So if you're a convicted felon or, or a domestic violence abuser, you can buy a gun legally without a background check and carry it loaded on the street without any consequences. So it's troubling. And also I think we are due to see more cases like this over time with the court that we currently have in place. So I fear this is going to be an important front of this sort of battle towards better, stronger, um, life-saving gun laws. Um, one more note on the litigation side is it's just in the last five years, we at Giffords launched what we refer to as an impact litigation program or affirmative litigation project, which was intended to bring litigation to seek accountability for the industry. Currently, we have a law in place at the federal level called PLACA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. And it essentially gives immunity to the gun industry for civil litigation or civil liability. So in other industries, cigarettes, cars, you name it, you can sue the industry as a way to bring forth the truth through discovery as a way to figure out if there's accountability for the harm caused by the product. Um, you can't do that in the gun space because of this 2005 PLACA law. Um, thankfully, so we, we've always been looking for creative ways to bring litigation to try and bring to light the realities of the industry and its practices, especially its marketing practices. Um, there's some states now that are passing new laws and California is one of them, which create, I don't wanna to get too much in the legal weeds, but it's called the Predicate Act Statute. So it creates a legal cause of action against the gun industry for violating certain very specific standards of behavior. Um, that law is not even in effect yet until 2023, but once it is in effect, I think it'll be really interesting to see if it can be utilized um, to bring litigation against the industry, especially those actors that are implementing really the more um, nefarious and, and negatively impacting practices that we see, whether it's distribution tactics, marketing tactics, things of that nature. So just to recap, um, I gave you a little bit of statistics around the nature of gun violence in America, how, you know, what the scope of the problem is. Um, talked a little bit about the history of the NRA, which I think has been the biggest impediment to getting these policies through, and a little bit about politics, the different types of gun violence, suicide, homicide, including um, mass shootings, domestic violence, and urban gun violence, police shootings, and then accidents or unintentional shootings, um, and then the policies associated with that a little bit about the second amendment and a little more about the intervention strategies that I'm very passionate about because I think they're incredibly effective. They're not as political. Um, getting funding for intervention strategies doesn't require um, passing a law which restricts guns, which sometimes runs you up against political barriers and really has an incredibly humane and appropriate approach to um, decades and decades of oppressive policing and other um, racist policies in, in a lot of communities. So that's some of the issue of gun violence, some of the solutions to gun violence, some of the scope of the problem and the sort of corollary aspects to it. Um, there's a lot more to say, but I'll leave it either for questions 
um, or for another day. If you want more information, consider going to the giffords.org website, especially if you look at, there's a wonderful section of statistics, which does a much better job of telling you um, all the all the details. If you're if you're a statistics and facts person, there's a whole lot of sections on every state or every policy area where you can see the current um, situation. It's a beautiful website that took us you know 20 years to build. So anything you need that I don't answer today, you can find there. So I strongly encourage you to take a look if you have more thoughts or questions and are interested. Um, with that, I think we're at all, but we're at five to two. So I will turn, unless there's anything else, I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you so much, Robin, for that fantastic presentation. Um, you gave so much information that I'm sure there's going to be a t uh, numerous questions. Um, I will, we will get to audience questions in just a few minutes. Uh, again, if you're in the audience and you have a question, please use Zoom's Q&A feature to send it in. But first I'm gonna hand it over to um, our Administration of Justice professor, Dr. Tobias Smith, who's going to uh, act as a discussant. He's going to just provide a little summary and ask a few of his own questions to get us started. And then we'll move on to the audience questions. Thanks so much, Catherine. Robin, thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. Um, I've had many conversations with you now over the years about your work and the work of the Gifford Center. Uh, you do such good policy analysis, and I'm just delighted that you were able to share some of this information uh, with our community, and in particular with my students. I have a whole class of my Introduction to Administration of Justice students here now, as well as some students from my criminology class and from criminal law. And you touched on all of those areas, questions about general policy, but also um, about what we can know about legal interventions um, and uh, the surprising data that uh, you shared about how uh, gun violence relates to patterns of crime. Uh, I had planned to do a bit of a, a summation, but uh, you beat me to the punch with your wonderful uh, closing summation yourself. So rather than sort of go over that material at length, I just want to name a couple of the things that you said that really surprised me and that maybe resonate with some other folks out there. Uh, the first was you shared those wonderful statistics about gun violence. And I was struck by what a big percentage um, of uh, gun deaths are made up by suicides. Um, I think uh, if other folks in the audience are like me, uh, the, the first thing one thinks when one thinks about gun violence is um, uh, mass shootings and uh, urban gun violence, which you named, um, and to see that that was dwarfed by people uh, harming themselves using uh, these weapons uh, came as a big surprise and really changed the way that I thought about uh, gun policy, about who uh, who were uh, we need to protect and how we need to protect them. Um, also, the uh, the segment of gun violence that's intimate partner violence was striking, and you mentioned that in a couple of different ways, that um, we're not talking necessarily about strangers or people who are engaged in economic transactions, but also uh, loved ones, uh, and that guns play a role uh, in those disputes and in escalating those disputes. Uh, the third thing you said that surprised me, and uh, I suspect surprised a lot of other people was about how safe California is in terms of its its rate of gun violence compared to other places. Um, California gets a bad rep, right? I mean, we we think about California as having these these hot spots of of gun violence in LA and in uh, in the Bay Area, and certainly uh, those centers have more gun violence than than elsewhere. But to think that we're actually um, much safer and doing a lot better than maybe media portrayals uh, suggest is, is really optimistic and hopeful. So I appreciated uh, that point, And that's something I'm going to remember and bring up uh, in class going forward. Uh, you gave us a lot, a lot of policies. I'm looking over my list of policies that you named from uh, locking up guns to red flag laws, background checks, uh, addressing large capacity magazines, uh, which was new to me. Uh, and then uh, the ceasefire program in, in Oakland, you said that uh, less than half of 1% of uh, folks are committing the vast majority of urban shootings. So uh, the idea that we could really target that population uh, was 
uh, was a real light bulb. Uh, and then finally, you, you did that great summary of the constitutional law issues around the Second Amendment and mentioned uh, the Heller case and how it overturned two centuries of um, settled precedent, which is a shock. Now, given where the Supreme Court has gone in the years since then, overturning precedent maybe is not such a big surprise in the rearview mirror. But uh, nonetheless, uh, to, to throw uh, hundreds of years of settled practice under the bus uh, really changes the landscape. So uh, that was interesting to, I'm sure to me and to folks in, in who are studying criminal law with me and uh, who have a background in law. Uh, I have a ton of questions, but I know that uh, lots of my students do too. So uh, I'm gonna start with a first general question, which is um, for folks listening today who have heard for an hour about gun violence, and probably can go home and talk to their partner or their parents and come up at the dinner table. Maybe their, their family has a different feeling about guns than they do. Uh, what would you say is the one big takeaway that you want folks to remember and maybe bring up in a, in a dinner conversation, something that they learned about gun violence from this talk? So particularly because I think sometimes we as individuals get overwhelmed by the problem, the policies, it feels like too much for uh, maybe one person to, to hold. Um, I, I like people to walk away with the basic understanding that we do have solutions to the problem that are proven by research to actually work. So to have hope that even with the scale of this problem that we actually know how to solve it. I think that's really important. I think also because of the, you know, I, I just skimmed the questions in the Q and A and I saw there was one about like before risk protective orders, why couldn't we just take someone's guns away? And I think it's with the second amendment and whether you agree with it or not right now with the Supreme court, you have an individual right. The reason we couldn't take the gun away before was because we needed the right due process in place that protected that individual right. I mean, it's just simply, a for me, as somebody who believes in civil rights, really important that those rights that are enshrined um, come along with appropriate protection and process. So these laws created the appropriate structure and process to allow us to take action to protect rights. So with that in mind, you know, you have a right to guns in America to whatever extent you believe the constitution protects it, but with rights, for come, with rights come responsibilities. And that question of where your rights hit up against the rights of other people, how do we create a system where, yes, you have this right, the right has to be protected, and we need to make sure we protect the right of a larger society to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to safety. So walk away from this with the knowledge that, you know, there's a right and there's a responsibility that comes with it. And all of these policies I talked about today are part of what I think encompass that responsibility, responsibility of government, responsibility of individuals to hold carefully a right that does have the potential to cause so much harm differently than say speech or assembly or anything else. You know, this is a lethal weapon. And so approach it with care. And I hope people can walk away from this feeling a little bit more comfortable in that conversation that this isn't just a black and white, you either support the second amendment or you don't. I support the second amendment. I just think it comes along with a really robust set of regulations that make our community safer. So that's what I would say about that, but I could keep going, but I won't. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I hope uh, students out there that you do bring this up at your at your dinner conversations tonight. Um, I have a whole list of additional questions, but I know that there are questions in the Q&A and as I was added as a moderator late, other folks I think have better access to those questions. So maybe Catherine, if you can uh, uh, uplift a couple of questions. Sure, um, I'll go ahead and ask uh, a question we got from an audience member, which was why doesn't the government ban the sale of guns? They're not toys, they're used to kill. If you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that relates really easily to the comment I just made, which is that at this point in America, first of all, we have something like 300 to 350 million guns. I'm going to pause there. 
300 to 350 million guns, more guns than people in America um, right now in private hands. Now they're only held by about 25% of the population. But that being said, there's a lot of guns already out there. So unless you're going to ban them and get them away from people, it's not going to necessarily have as much impact anyway, but you can't because of the second amendment. So in fact, there was a a regulation in the city of Chicago, which required you to have live firing practice in order to buy a gun, which I think is a great idea, and banned live shooting ranges within the city limits. And that was challenged in court. And the court said, no, you can't do that because that's in essence, just banning the sale of the gun. And we can't do that. That is too high of a burden on the second amendment right. So you can burden the right to a certain extent in order to create safety. You can't burden it out of existence or you're violating that constitutional right. And you know, as a constitutional lawyer, I could talk all day about the balance that needs to happen between the right and, and the restriction. Um, but suffice it to say, not selling guns would run afoul of the second amendment and in any situation, but certainly with the court we have today, it's not even in the realm of possibility you know, at any point. So it's just simply not a viable approach. I, I get often asked, what about repealing the second amendment? Why don't we do that? Um, it's an interesting thought, certainly again, as somebody who cares a lot about uh, you know, the Bill of Rights and the Second and the Amendments, I think it's always interesting to question whether they're still applicable. However, to, to repeal an amendment, um, you would need two thirds of the House and the Senate and the states. And that's something I don't see happening at any time soon in this country. So while in theory, it's an interesting, one more interesting idea on the table, I think in reality, it's very, very far from what would ever be viable. Um, I'll field the next question that we have from a student, uh, which is not about getting rid of gun laws, but actually trying to use them to uh, other people's advantage. And this question is, what do you think about some groups arming themselves for self-defense against corrupt policing like the Black Panther Party or assault like Armed Women of America? Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, in theory, you can't have a problem with it because, again, if you whether you agree or disagree with the court's holdings, um, you have a right. And at this point, we're saying you have, the court is saying you have a right, not just within your home, but outside your home for self-defense. So in theory, people arming themselves for self-defense, whether it's against other individuals or against law enforcement um, is permissible by the Supreme Court. Now, so that being said, it's not necessarily a legal objection I have, although I would say it's a slippery slope in very much the wrong direction. So in other words, one of the statistics facts that we know for sure is anywhere where you have more guns, you have more gun violence, right? There's this argument often made by the NRA and their allies, like, you know, the only thing that stops a good guy with bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Well, if that were true, we'd be the safest country in the world because we have such high rates of gun ownership. And in fact, we're the most dangerous country in the world for civilian gun violence. So it's just not true. It doesn't work that way. When you have more guns, there's more accidents, there's more suicides, there's more escalation between people, there's more domestic violence. Just that's why, back to your point, Tobias, why we have one of the lowest gun death rates in the country in California because we have one of the lowest gun ownership rates in the country. In addition to all of the good regulations we have and huge investment. I mean, you mentioned LA, Oakland, San Francisco. These are cities that have reduced gun violence in the most impacted communities. In LA and in, in neighborhoods like South Central, they've reduced gun violence by 80% in the last 10 years. I mean, there's been incredible strides. There's still too much violence in those communities, but the 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 progress has been really really amazing because of investment in these intervention strategies so you know should we be allowing more people to arm to protect themselves from police or others i mean i'm cautious to make comments on what's right for for individuals however i know for sure if everyone started arming themselves in this way we would simply see more gun violence not to mention that would justify law enforcement making an assumption more people have guns and taking more, you know, drastic, more um, aggressive measures because the assumption that people have guns would be actually validated. So, you know, in my mind, 
less guns, less gun violence, less gun ownership is the way we reduce gun violence. But there's sort of two different layers of question here. So I'm cautious not to say much about the first because, you know, when I read about the back Black Panthers, there's a part of me that appreciates what was going on culturally and socially and, and where that came from. Okay, great. Thank you for wading into that. Uh, I can ask another audience question. So this one says, I'm wondering if in a few years you think gun violence will reduce or get worse. How can we get these laws passed in Congress to reduce gun violence and deepen background checks? I mean, that's an interesting question. I it, gun violence had been reducing for years. So it was very plateaued for a long time at about 30, 32,000 people a year, um, which actually meant it was going down because population was increasing. Um, and it was, it was pretty stagnant, but also not increasing. And unfortunately, uh, with the COVID epidemic, pandemic, um, gun violence has increased acro across a multiple of those areas I discussed earlier. So dramatic increases in urban communities and domestic violence um, accidents and all of that is suicide is really predictable because unfortunately, COVID increased all of the underlying factors that lead to a lot of this violence. People were isolated and depressed and that caused an increase in suicides. Women were stuck at home with abusers who were under more pressure, domestic violence increased, urban communities were under more pressure. And all of those intervention programs I talked about, many of them had to stop operating because they relied upon street outreach workers meeting with people in the communities and they had to stop doing that. So gun violence shot up by like 20% to 30% in some communities during COVID. And that was devastating to witness. You also had a huge uptick in the purchase of private guns. People got really scared during COVID. 50 million guns were sold in the first like six months of the epidemic. So COVID did not do good things for gun violence in America. Now we are starting to see a little bit of a reduction in all of those things now that it seems like in most places things have cooled off. So, so it's hard to answer that question because we're at kind of an all time high right now because of COVID. My expectation is that it's going to go down. Now, again, you have all these new privately owned guns on the streets and out in public in private hands. So that may not be the case everywhere, but certainly I think in general, hopefully it will go back down at least to the levels it was at before COVID. Um, what I think might happen, and this is just my gut from years of watching this issue, is that it's going to go down in places like California, where we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars into intervention strategies and risk protective orders and suicide prevention. And it's going to go up in places where you have no regulation and now even higher rates of gun ownership, like, unfortunately, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Wyoming, Alaska, there's these states that always come in at the top of the gun death um, per capita spectrum because they have no laws, they have a lot of lot of gun ownership, so tons of suicide and accidents and domestic violence. Um, and so I, I fear you might see because there's more guns in private hands now, slight increases in those states where you already had such high rates. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, I'm ever the optimist or you could never work on an issue like this, that things are going to get better. We just did pass in June, this bipartisan safer communities act, the first significant federal legislation in 40 years, um, led by Chris Murphy and oddly, um, Tom Tillis from North Carolina and a few others. Um, and it actually makes some significant steps. It doesn't have universal background checks, sadly, that should be the first thing put in place because it's kind of the, the floor for all other laws to be based around. You can't restrict people's ability to buy guns if they can just buy them from you know, a private seller without a background check. That being said, huge investments into risk protective orders, community violence intervention, mental health support in school systems, um, closing that dating partner loophole and a bunch of new trafficking regulations and tracing mechanisms and support. So it ha does have a lot of good stuff in it. And my hope is that as those new laws play out, that we will see a reduction in violence in many places. So I'm optimistic, 
always and also see the trends in many places just getting worse and worse. I think it's something like Louisiana has four times the gun death rate of California per capita. So, you know, it's really significant, the difference. If you go to the website, there's a section of the Giffords website where we rank the states. We like give them a grade based on their gun laws and we put their grade next to their gun death rate. So you can see for yourself that correlation between me saying strong gun laws reduce gun violence you know, you can see it when you look at those, those charts and it, when in seeing the gun death rate, it's, you know, one, I, making this up, but like 1.7 per capita in California and like 7.2 and, you know, Mississippi, you can see the difference. It's, it's really stark. I mean, Tobias is right. California does have, because we have such a huge population, because we have a very complex population in a lot of ways, you know, ethnically and geographically, because we have cities that have historically had really high rates of gun violence, people think we have a big problem and we do. However, it would be like exponentially worse if we had the kind of gun death rates as some of these, these other states with no regulation. So it's just something to like have a little perspective on. All right, I will field the next um, audience question. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that great answer for the last one. Um, when you discuss gun possession, could you discuss the clear divide between violence of black market guns versus legal possession of guns? Most people with legal possession of guns are more responsible, correct? Yes, that is correct. So, you know, we have gosh, it's hard to know an exact number because we don't actually have any me mechanism for tracking it, but we believe we have something like 80 to 100 million gun owners in America, private gun owners. And the vast majority, a huge, probably 95% of them are responsible. You know, most of the gun owners I know are really responsible. They have gun safes, they lock them up, they have registered, they have background checks, they you know, are careful with them, they store the ammunition separately, all the things you should do if you're gonna choose to be a gun owner. And they take it very seriously. They go to the shooting range, they take care of their guns. Um, you know, most gun owners not only are responsible, but they agree with almost all of the regulations that I mentioned today. So, you know, 80% of gun owners are fine with universal background checks, risk protective orders, safe storage laws, on and on. They don't actually believe that they should have no regulation of guns, which is what the NRA is fighting for. So legal gun owners are really responsible for the most part. And many of them actually know better than anyone the risk guns present and are very comfortable with the idea that we need to um, take steps to protect our families and our communities from gun violence. Now, there's a distinction made between, you know, black market guns or illegal guns and legally owned guns. You know, the problem with gun ownership is that it's the guns legally owned right up until it's not. In other words, you can buy a gun and in that moment have no intent to do any harm with it, whether it's domestic violence or mass shooting or suicide or anything. And you're, you know, quote, a responsible legal gun owner. But when you have millions and millions and millions of these guns, unfortunately, the point at which your child, you forget to lock it up and your kid gets it or your suicidal teenager or, um, you know, your angry spouse. Um, and then all of a sudden a gun that was responsibly owned and legally acquired becomes a gun that has a you know, high risk of harming someone. So the distinction is often a false one. Now, that being said, you know, a lot of the guns that are showing up on the streets of urban communities tend to be guns that are not bought through, you know, can you, California is a good example because California requires universal background checks. So when you acquire a gun without a background check, it's by nature, an illegal gun. That being said, that same gun acquired the same way in a state without background checks is a legal gun. So you end up with these odd distinctions between legal and illegal, right? Is it legal within a universal context or within a local context? Because then you're starting to make value judgments on who should get a pass and who shouldn't, you know, a rich white person in Mississippi buying a gun without a background check, but who's a domestic violence abuser, technically didn't violate a law buying the gun, but the you know, a person of color on the streets of Oakland who can get a cheaper gun to protect themselves from violence on the streets, but doesn't do a background check is illegal. So 
some of those distinctions get really tricky really fast because we don't have a universal system in this country. That being said, certainly I believe in those regulations. And if somebody buys a gun quote on the black market um, or without abiding local regulations, you know, you are initially by your nature owning a gun illegally. And I think that that part of the system is, is a kind of a piece of the problem. I'm not sure if that's making sense, but you know, because we have this really disparate patchwork system, sometimes even knowing what the laws are, and they're different, not just state to state, city to city. I mean, California doesn't have preemption. So in California, every city can have its own regulations beyond the state laws, which are different from other state laws. So I think one of the many problems we have on this issue is we don't have uniform laws, and it can be difficult for folks to understand how to comply with them. And also what you said is true, or what you imply, I think, in your question is true, which is that, you know, the guns that are being acquired in, um, you know, communities of color where there's a lot of violence and um, often are being acquired for either self-protection or some other reason um, are causing a lot of problems. And if we could reduce the flow of those guns into those communities, that alone would have a positive impact of some type within those communities. So it doesn't it absolve um, that from happening. But I do think, you know, the legal illegal gun thing, you know, I like to talk more about people who should and shouldn't have guns, right? So it's, I think there's a more interesting question about who is responsible and who is dangerous and who's going to take care and you know behave in a way i mean terrible but useful example is Trayvon Martin and and the man who shot him who i i don't like to name the shooters ever because i don't want to give them any any um stature here but you know the man who shot Trayvon Martin you know he was a legal gun owner he bought that gun legally and you know i don't want to give any credence to this idea you buy the gun legally and he was acquitted, right? So technically with the stand your ground laws, which we didn't even talk about today, which is a whole nother set of, for especially for those of you who are doing criminal law work, you know, stand your ground laws are astounding because they shift the burden of proof to prosecutors to prove something wasn't self-defense when the one witness is dead. So you have this man who shot Trayvon Martin saying it was self-defense. The prosecutor's job is not in the normal situation of a criminal case where you want to say it was self-defense. You have to prove that it was self-defense. With stand your ground laws, you don't. The prosecutor has to prove it wasn't self-defense. So it turns the whole system on its head. You're, you're better served in terms of your own defense to make sure the other witness is dead because then it's much easier for them to not prove you didn't do self-defense. And I know I'm kind of getting on this tangent, but you know, a lot of these laws upend the whole nature of our common law system, which is in place for good reason. You know, the right, the duty to retreat from a conflict when you can do so safely is there for a reason. And when you pass standard ground laws, you upend that and say, you have no duty to retreat, even if you can do so safely, you have a subjective right to shoot to kill. And so, you know, Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of taking this le legal illegal question to the side a bit because I think it does start to raise questions of, of values and laws and, and how we judge who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, who should have guns and who shouldn't. So anyway, it's a little complicated, but I'm glad I got to mention standard ground laws because they really make me very angry as you might as you might have picked up on. <laughs> And that was another gun industry effort. There was a, um, a big push about 15 years ago, 20 years ago across the country to pass stand your ground laws in as many states as possible. And it passed in 26 states as a way to, again, encourage gun ownership. You know, it was a push by the gun lobby and the NRA to pass these laws so that if you buy a gun, you don't have to worry so much about getting in trouble if you use it because you can just claim self-defense. And that is how they marketed guns in those states was, well, now we have a law in place that you won't get in trouble if you shoot someone. So you should get a gun, essentially. Tobias, your hand is up. Yeah, I put my hand up. I, uh, I don't have full access to the queue of questions, but I may be jumping on somebody else, but I wanted to get one more question in before uh, for the end of the talk. Um, obviously, even though we're all remote right now and virtual, we are a, a school or a, um, 
a large social institution. And of course, your center, uh, the Giffords Law Center, was founded around shooting at another large institution. Um, so, of course, as, as teachers and students, uh, school violence is on our brains. And I, uh, I'm curious about two things. First, as someone who looks at this data a lot, if you could talk to us about um, perception aside, the relative risk of uh, school shootings versus other kinds of shootings. And then second, as we talk about policy um, at the institutional level, at the level of Ohlone, are there things that are shown to work or not work? So does arming our police officers work? Does locking down our schools work? What do we know about what works and doesn't work in school? I would love to hear your thoughts on these two questions. Yeah, so um, as far as like the relative risk of school shootings, I, I mean, school shootings have gone up dramatically in the last... I don't know, four or five years. We don't know if it's copycat shootings or increased anxiety and stress on students or just more guns or what, but it has gone up really dramatically, not just mass shootings, but shootings in general. Um, you know, there's still a lot of debate over what works and doesn't work. You are seeing in a lot of places a move towards arming guards, locking doors, um, I, I don't personally think arming guards or teachers is a good idea. I think there's, you increase the chance of accidents and harm when you have guns in schools. I mean, arming teachers is just an absurd concept. And I think arming guards, you know, it's like a, it's like a band-aid on a stab wound. You know, it's, there was armed guards at Columbine. There have been armed guards at many schools that have experienced mass shootings. The chances of that guard stopping the shooter are infinitesimal. A lot of times when it's students or former students, they know exactly where the guards are and what they're doing. But, you know, there's just, it's, it's not really proven to make a difference. And in the meantime, you're introducing guns into a school environment. So I'm not sure I buy, believe in that, but I don't know there's like great hard data that would be against it. Um, locking schools, you know, these days, I think for a variety of reasons, it's probably not so bad to have limited entry points for so many reasons. Um, so I'm not so opposed to that, although I think it's a little bit of a red herring in terms of really stopping shootings. If, you know, we've had many sh examples of sh school shooters in the last few years that just shot their way through the front door. So with assault weapons, you know, there's not much you're going to do about that. So sure, it's, I don't know that it's bad, but I don't know that again, it's really going to solve the problem. Um, what I think does work, or at least shows more promise of working is more um, educating of teachers and students more de-escalation, more anti-bullying campaigns, more, um, you know, back to my friend Mark Bowman's book, Trigger Points, you know, understanding the profiles and behavior patterns of those likely to commit violence and really taking proactive steps, having better counselors and better mental health support for students and for young people. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of funding in that bill that I talked about for school mental health services. And I think that would actually be the best step forward. And, and on a separate note, separate of preventing shootings and violence, I think our students need it. I have two school age kids and there's, they're struggling with post COVID and anxieties and all kinds of issues that I think really matter. And schools do not have good resources. I mean, my kids go to good schools and they don't have good resources. So you know, I think we really do need to recognize that that school environment is a place where we have an opportunity to provide a lot of support and resources to those who are struggling. And most school shooters are students or former students, not always. We certainly see some horrific examples otherwise. But, you know, when you're talking about hundreds of school shootings already this year, almost all of them are students or former students. So there is a lot of opportunity um, to intervene and to provide support and to identify. I mean, there's a bunch of instances where students have identified another student who they think presents a risk and they've been able to prevent shootings. So that's what I meant about educating students and teachers about looking for for signs, having a system where students can report it anonymously, um, having teachers as well be more empowered to um, take steps when they think a student presents a risk. So I think there's a lot of softer measures that actually could be more effective and also could help support our communities in, in multiple ways. Thank you so much for that answer. You're welcome.
Um, I'm looking at the list just to make sure we didn't miss anything. And I don't think, I don't think, I think we got anything. to all of them, I believe. Um, and so I'm just gonna, we're at our time. And so I'm just gonna wrap up by thanking you again, Robin, so much for joining us and sharing so much of your uh, incredible knowledge on this topic. I think everyone in attendance learned a lot today and we really appreciate that. And for the audience members, thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm gonna share the screen for our next Lytton Center event, um, which is on November 15th from 1 to 3 p.m. We are gonna be doing a screening of a documentary called The Race Epidemic and then having a conversation with the producer. And so we hope you'll be able to uh, mark your calendars for that day and join us then too. Um, again, thank you everyone so much and a special thank you to Robin. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And I wanna thank our wonderful interpreters um, for their time and their effort today to make this event accessible to everyone in our community. We really appreciate you. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Heather. Thanks, everyone.